Hey there, how's it going? My name is Christian Sakamoto with Plan Your Federal Retirement. Back with another video with our All About FERS series. Today, I wanted to give a high-level overview on estate planning. Micah and I recently recorded a podcast together where we talked about estate planning and we went a little bit more into the weeds when it comes to estate planning. So make sure you check out that, that podcast. But today, I just wanted to condense a lot of that information and just talk about it at a you know, an estate planning 101 level. Now, legal disclaimer is I am a certified financial planner professional. I'm not an estate planning attorney. So when you go and consult somebody when it comes to estate planning and you're ready to get these documents drafted, it's probably a good idea to talk to an estate planning attorney. But from a financial planner's perspective, that's what I want to talk about today and really just educate from that lens. This is relevant for not only federal employees and retirees, but I would say anybody who's over the age of 18, there are three documents that I say everybody must have if they're over the age of 18. Number one would be the last will and testament, the will. Number two would be the durable power of attorney. And number three would be the advanced healthcare directive. So starting with number one, the will. This is the document I'd say most familiar for a lot of people. When you pass away, first things will transfer by title. So however it is titled, you can have uh, just individual title. You can have a joint title of an asset. It could be titled in the name of a business. It could be titled in the name of the trust. Most commonly, this would be a house or a vehicle. Those are pretty common for title. So whoever's on title, if it's not just yourself, that's who would get that asset upon death or whoever is named on that trust, whoever that beneficiary is named or beneficiaries are named, that's who would get that particular asset. So again, first things would transfer by title. Number two, the order of operations would be they would transfer by beneficiary designation. And beneficiary designation, there are four beneficiary designations for federal employees. And there are four beneficiary designations. If you are a federal employee that I want you to go and review and make sure that you have a beneficiary listed, a primary and a contingent for all four. And they are the FERS retirement. Number two would be the TSP, the thrift savings plan. Number three would be the federal employee group life insurance. And number four would be your last LES, your last pay stub, your last leaving earnings statement. We can name beneficiary designations on all four of these under uh, the FERS system. Go ahead and do that. It's very important, especially if you haven't updated it in a while. Make sure you go and review those. Those beneficiary designations don't just stop there. We might also have life insurance outside of the federal government that we can name beneficiaries on. We might have you know, bank accounts, savings accounts, or we can name POD, TOD, payable on death transferable on death, IRAs, anything else that we can name a beneficiary designation on, I always recommend having that up to date for primary, but also contingent. Primary would say whoever is alive at the time and you've listed as primary, that's who gets the asset. God forbid if they're not alive, when you pass away, then the contingent person or persons would then get that asset. So first, it would transfer by title. Number two is beneficiary designation. And number three would be it would transfer through the probate process. And the probate process is now where the will comes in and guides that probate process. So everything that we either forgot to name or didn't name or anything else that wasn't able to have a title or beneficiary, this is where the will comes in to guide that process for where you want your things to go. So number two would be the durable power of attorney. And this is important that it is durable. Durable meaning that it doesn't stop at your incapacitation. So God forbid, the example I would say is you're, you're driving down the road and you, know, you, hit, you hit something and you know, it, it's a moose if you're in Alaska, it's an elk if you're in the lower 48 or a deer somewhere and you end up in the hospital, right? But you're not dead. So you're incapacitated. The power of attorney is a very powerful document, probably the most powerful document that you would ever sign. And essentially it gives a person or multiple people the power to essentially sign as if it was you. The power for them to 
go into your bank account, to go and contact the utility company, to do lots of different things that are financial related. And a lot of times um, for a married couple, for each spouse, they might name each other as that primary power of attorney, that representative, that agent. And those powers are effective immediately. We might also see that be springing. This is especially uh, what we would see for someone who would be just an individual where we would name a, a family member or a close friend that we can name this person that sp is springing upon our incapacitation so that it is not effective immediately, but only begins at that incapacitation. Again, a very powerful document, very important document that you should have. Number three is the advanced healthcare directive. So kind of on those same lines, if you're incapacitated, the advanced healthcare directive, you could basically pre-fill out what your health-related decisions that you would want to see happen to you, that those get performed, and it appoints that personal representative, that agent, to go and make those decisions for you. Now, a lot of times people think, well, I'm married, therefore I can do that already, or this is my son or daughter, you know, they're, they're over 18, I, I can do that, I'm the parent. That's not necessarily the case. There's HIPAA laws that prevent some of this stuff. So the Advanced Healthcare Directive is very, very important. Some states might call it something else, but the gist is that we can make those financial related decisions and we can appoint the, those people that we want on the document now, as opposed to having them scramble to make those decisions for us um, in the event of a very unfortunate situation. So there are those three that I mentioned, the will, the power of attorney, the advanced healthcare directive. Number four is the optional one, and this would be the revocable living trust. Now, the revocable living trust would be in addition to the will. The will would be considered a pour over will, and the revocable living trust would be the document that you could name for title on certain assets, you could name for beneficiary designation on certain assets, that instead of going through the probate process, you now have the trust that you can get a lot more specific with how you want your assets to be transferred. This is especially important if you have property in multiple states so that you're not going through the probate process in multiple different states, which can be a lot of time, but also very costly for our beneficiaries or for our loved ones after we passed. It could also be true if we're concerned about privacy as the trust is a private document and it's not a public document or a publicly available document that is everybody can view and see through the probate process. It's private. It's also very important if we have children, even if they're minor children or children who are young adults, where we're not wanting to maybe give them a million dollars or more at that young age. Maybe we want to be specific on what age they get it or at what life events that they might have access to the money. We could also create a special needs trust inside this revocable living trust. Uh, we can also create spendthrift provisions. So if that is important to you or if that pertains to you, a trust might be a document that you'd want to include in all of this. It could also simplify the estate planning process for you as well because the trust becomes the kind of the sole document that you get to name who gets what, at what age, at what interval, as opposed to on every single beneficiary designation, if you wanted to make a change in the future, having to go to each and every one of those beneficiary designations to make a change. And that's common where people today might have a certain list of people that they want their stuff to go. And then as their children grow up and they start families of their own, now there's grandchildren or just people move away and pass away that we'd want to make changes to who we've named for where we want our stuff to go. The trust can simplify that because now any change that we want to make, we just have to change it once inside the trust. And because everything is pointing towards the trust by title or beneficiary, now we are, again, simplifying that process. So again, just want to give some of the high level overviews when it comes to the estate planning documents, some of the documents that you must have, especially when it comes to beneficiary designations that are important to federal employees and just going through some of those pros and cons. If this has been helpful to you, make sure you leave a like and make sure you are subscribed to our YouTube channel so you get our latest videos and content that we put out. If you have a question related to this, feel free to leave your question below in the comment section. And until next time, happy planning.